So a very good evening to everyone. I welcome you all to the PGIMR Path Alumni Global Education Endeavor Lecture Series. And today's lecture is on uh, cognition disorder, and it will be presented by Dr. Jasmina Aluwalia. Uh, Dr. Jasmina Aluwalia is the graduate done her graduation from uh, AFMC Pune, and she has done her MD from PGIMR yes, Chandigarh from the Department of Pathology, and she is currently the professor of uh, in the department of hematology and her area of interest is in thrombotic and uh, bleeding disorder and anti phospholipid uh, antibody syndrome she has numerous publication in this field in the various international and national journal she has more than 20 year experience uh, in this field and uh, lots of people like me have learned a lot from madam uh, so over to you ma'am please start Uh, right. So, can you see my screen? Yeah, absolutely fine. Please go ahead. Okay. So, uh, thank you for this opportunity of uh, presenting some cases which taught me uh, in the coagulation lab. Uh, over the next forty-five minutes or so, I would like to share uh, uh, some of these cases, which took some time for diagnosis. Some of them were obvious initially; others we had to work through. so all of us are aware that uh, there is uh, the coagulation lab plays a very important part in the management of bleeding disorders because the results from this lab will influence treatment options essentially the lab will be required to characterize the coagulopathy and to pinpoint whether it's a platelet defect or a coagulation factor defect once that is done we may need to further sub characterize the type of coagulopathy this is especially true for diseases like von willebrand disease and once the disease is diagnosed then to monitor therapy especially factor replacements the lab may be required to perform a series of tests uh before we go into the cases proper let us see a few general considerations which are important as far as testing in the coagulation lab are concerned coagulation tests are many of them are functional assays hence they are difficult to perform and are very finicky to pre analytical handling the way the sample is collected transported stored and eventually analyzed will affect the final results these tests are expensive patient samples are uh, precious especially uh, when we have uh, pediatric samples so it's important to keep certain things in mind before undertaking coagulation testing history forms the cornerstone of uh, the lab diagnosis of a of a bleeding disorder and this is because the history guides us to the kind of defect there may be a hematrosis or a deep bleed may uh, suggest a coagulation factor defect whereas a wet mucocutaneous bleed may suggest a platelet related bleeding defect and direct tests there in that fashion the presence of a comorbid illness for instance liver disease or a dic may actually mask the underlying bleeding disorder if it is uh, present alongside with that ble bleeding disorder and this needs to be kept in mind and history for these must be taken at the time uh, when testing is ordered any recent transfusion with blood products especially fresh frozen plasma or factor replacement will affect the baseline levels of uh, the factors in the patient and hence will uh, uh, affect the final result that the lab test will produce many times a bleeding patient will arrive in the emergency room late in the evening when just a basic screen can be done and the diagnosis cannot be reached at this time it really helps to take in the history if there is some other family member su suffering from the same illness and if possible to call that member to work out the uh, the uh, lab defects in a more uh, you know controlled and easy fa fashion rather than on a post transfusion sample we all know that a freshly drawn citrate sample is required for coagulation tests and there must be no clots in the sample before transfer to the lab because activation of the uh, coagulation cascade and consumption of factors will uh, affect the tests in an unpredictable fashion 
so at our institute we invest in a pathologist who screens for the appropriateness of samples before testing is undertaken so history taking and deciding what samples have to be taken and when the testing is to be done is decided by the pathologist uh, this helps us to uh, avoid repeat testing and cuts costs and the other thing that we have learned over the years is just as the clinical side likes to maintain a registry we also maintain a register of our old patients in the lab because many times when they come in an emergency situation we can refer to this and uh, just proceed uh, with the further work up rather than spending time on establishing the basic diagnosis so that said we know that the basic screening tests for coagulation include the prothrombin time the activated partial thromboplastin time the fibrinogen assay and the platelet count these four tests are really uh, the basis of all uh, coagulation screening other than this thrombin time may be included because this helps to pick up a deficiency or a um, absence or a dysfunctional fibrinogen protein but it is really very important for us who work in labs attached to hospitals to pick up heparin contamination of the sample heparin in the sample can affect most of our coagulation test results hence this test is really important if there is a suspicion that the sample is contaminated with heparin the bleeding time is included in the clotting screen in the coagulation screen however this test is not uh, really very popular anymore because it's difficult to standardize and needs a trained operator and many patients are children where this test is really difficult to perform so that's it let us go to the first case this was a 5 year old male who presented with bluish patches on the arms and legs uh, noticed on minor trauma he had joint swellings which had appeared since 2 years of age there was no history of any transfusions in the past he had two elder siblings who were normal the screening coagulation test revealed a prolongation of the aptt and the minute we get this in the laboratory the next question we have to answer is is this prolongation of the clotting time the result of a factor deficiency or an inhibitor and for this we perform a simple test called the mixing study in which the patient's plasma is mixed with an equal volume of normal pool plasma and the prolonged test is repeated so in this patient the aptt was 89 that of normal pool plasma was 31 and when we mix we find that the aptt normalizes so if the test normalizes on adding normal pool plasma this is suggestive of a factor deficiency so uh, the next thing to confirm is what kind of a factor deficiency there is so for that there is a uh, the way to do it is to add a uh, to the patient's plasma a factor deficient plasma in case of an aptt prolongation in a male the likely possibilities are a hemophilia a or b so if we make a one is to one mixture of the patient's plasma with factor 8 deficient plasma and if the patient's plasma is deficient in factor 8 then the clotting time will not correct if however the clotting time corrects as is seen here in this case with factor 9 deficient plasma that means the patient sample is not deficient in factor 9 so at the end of this clotting study we, we can see that the uh, mixing uh, studies are suggesting that there is a factor 8 deficiency this is confirmed by a factor 8 assay which was less than 1% in this case so this uh, boy had hemophilia a what we do next is to usually ask for a dna sample to be stored for mutation detection uh, which is helpful in uh, patients where the family is not yet complete and further pregnancies are anticipated so this helps for antenatal counseling and career uh, and carrier screening in the sibling so that was a straightforward case of hemophilia a which many of us working in coagulation labs would encounter now coming to the next one this was a 4 month old baby who was brought with history of irritability The MRI had revealed a subdural hematoma in the left frontoparietal region and a right subdural hemorrhage. The parents denied any history of head trauma and he was already on phenobarbitone and phenytoin for generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Prior to coming to our center he had received two fresh frozen plasmas and a packed red cell transfusion 10 days before. Sorry and uh, the screening tests in this child revealed a prolonged PT and APTT the fibrinogen was normal so when the mixing tests were done on both the PT and the APTT we can see that the PT is correcting to within 2 seconds of the upper limit of the reference range so this is correction whereas the APTT only showed partial correction came down from 103 to 40 43 so since both the PT and APTT were prolonged 
the likely possibility in this child was a deficiency in the common pathway so we needed to look for correction with factor 2 factor 5 and factor 10 deficient plasma and here in this uh, we noticed that the aptt was uh, showing no correction on mixing with factor 2 5 or 10 deficient plasma whereas the pt showed some correction with factor 2 and factor 5 deficient plasma but none with factor 10 so this is a sort of a confusing picture and we are able to reach no conclusion on which specific factor is missing so in that situation we tend to reflect straight to the factor assays and in this patient we can see that the uh, factor 2 and factor 10 assays were below the uh, limits expected at this stage so this patient has multiple clotting factor deficiencies in children uh, this could be the result of the immaturity of the neonatal liver. Uh, it is unable to produce adequate amount of uh, the various coagulation factors. There might be an underlying liver dysfunction which may be responsible for it. We can see a similar picture in patients with the late hemorrhagic disease of the newborn and if there is DIC and sepsis, we might get multiple uh, coagulation factor defects. When we encountered this in the lab, we asked for a repeat test after, a, after some time to confirm this. And so when this child came two months later, the tests were repeated and again the PT was mildly prolonged, but the APT continued to remain markedly prolonged. And this time we did a correction only on the APTT, which showed uh, correction within normal uh, to normal range, suggesting that there is still a factor deficiency. And since we had already seen a low factor 2 and factor 10, these were repeated at this visit and we found that both of them were now within normal limits. But because the PT was prolonged and prolonged PT is associated with a factor 7 deficiency, we ran that assay. And this was just borderline low, uh, sorry, was within the reference range for this uh, expected age. But this could not uh, explain the prolonged, prolonged APTT that we continued to get. So we just took a hunch and did a correction with factor 8 deficient plasma, which showed failure to correct. And this was confirmed uh, on a factor 8 assay which showed 1% uh, factor 8. So this child did not have multiple clotting factor deficiencies. He actually had a hemophilia A. This was repeated again nine months later, and we could see that again, the APTT remained uh, prolonged at that time, and the uh, factor 8 levels were exceedingly low. So this brings us to the concept of developmental hemostasis in children. Uh, factor levels of factor 2, 5, 7, 9, 10 and 11 may not reach normal levels till 6 months of age and we must be aware of this at the lab because deficiencies of these factors can cause a mild prolongation of the PT and APT. But though these factors are mildly deficient as compared to adults, these children do not usually bleed because of this physiological deficiency. On the other hand, factor 8 and fibrinogen are almost at adult levels at birth and uh, it's important to remember that whenever we are looking at pediatric samples, we must keep the pediatric reference ranges in mind for proper interpretation. So this case goes to illustrate that multiple factor deficiencies of early childhood may mask the actual factor deficiency, which was hemophilia A in this case, uh, which gave rise to the bleeding. So in children, repeat testing may be necessary. A 16-year-old girl came with his history of hematochesia two and a half years back. She had history of on and off uh, episodes of epistaxis lasting over the last two years. There was no history of joint swellings, echymosis, menorrhagia. But uh, at the prior center, she had been found to have a prolonged APT. So the clinical possibility considered here, a female with bleeding and with a prolonged APT was von Willebrand disease. And we screened her uh, for the same. So the basic screening test again revealed the prolongation of the APT. And when we performed the correction, we could see uh, a mixing study, we could see correction with normal pooled plasma. And uh, with, on addition of factor 8 and factor 9 deficient plasma, also there was correction, which indicated that there is no deficiency of factor 8 or factor 9. In von Willebrand disease, the prolongation of APTT is expected to be as a result of the factor 8 deficiency. So this was a little bit cons uh, confusing here. So if we go back to our coagulation cascade, we can see that the prolongation in APTT can be due to a deficiency of factor 8, factor 9, factor 11, or factor 12. So 8 and 9 were not deficient from the mixing study. Uh, factor 12 doesn't usually come with bleeding, so it should not be really considered in this case. But a deficiency of factor 11 was not excluded yet. So we did a mixing study with factor 11, and sure enough, there was no correction, and the APTT continued to remain prolonged. 
So this child had a factor 11 deficiency, which was confirmed on the factor 11 assay, which is markedly reduced. Factor 11 is a rare bleeding disorder. And though the factor levels coincide very well with the prolongation in the clotting time, there is no correlation between the factor levels and the bleeding occurrence or its severity. It may present very late, and sometimes the patient may only present with a severe bleed when they are taken up for surgery, maybe diagnosed only then. And in females who have a prolonged APTT, this may look like a von Willebrand disease. So this case, the important lesson from here is that all females with bleeding and a prolonged APTT do not have von Willebrand disease. Uh, the fourth case is an 11-year-old boy who came with history of petechiae and ecchymosis since one and a half months of age. There was prolonged uh, bleeding post-trauma since one year of age. There were multiple episodes of epistaxis, a recent episode of hematuria, but there were no history of joint bleeds and uh, transfusions or infusion of blood components. The family history was uh, non-contributed for a bleeding disorder, and the investigation uh, preliminary uh, coagulation screen revealed a prolonged APTT again. So the mixing study here was suggestive of a factor 8 deficiency. So we did a factor 8 assay, which revealed a factor 8 level of 3%. So this falls into the category of a moderate hemophilia A. And we signed out the report saying that this looked like a moderate hemophilia A. At that time, we had just acquired a new coagulation analyzer, and we had got some startup kits for doing von Willebrand factor antigen and activity assay. So we were randomly storing uh, samples of patients with prolonged APTT for this assay. And one month later, when we ran this test, uh, this patient sample for the von Willebrand factor antigen and activity assay, we saw that his uh, von Willebrand factor antigen and activity were markedly reduced. So what we had labeled as a moderate hemophilia A was actually a von Willebrand disease. So it's important to exclude von Willebrand disease in all cases with mild or moderate hemophilia because severe von Willebrand disease can have factor 8 levels between 1 and 10 percent. So this now forms the standard uh, practice in our lab. Whenever we diagnose a factor 8 deficiency, we always run the uh, von Willebrand factor antigen and activity assay. Uh, the fifth case is a female child who weighed about 2.7 kgs and was uh, bought by her mother with history of bleeding from the umbilical stump from day three. There was history of older sib deaths in the family, but she also had two sibs who were alive and healthy. At the nursing home where she had been previously admitted, coagulation tests revealed a prolonged PT and APTT. She had received injection vitamin K at that nursing home, which was also repeated at our center, but there was no improvement in her coagulation times. So the coagulation screen was ordered, the PT and APTT were markedly prolonged, and this is usually suggestive of a, a severe fibrinogen deficiency, which was confirmed by just running the simple fibrinogen acid. The uh, afibrinogenemia was confirmed on a repeat sample after a, another month. Uh, patients with afibrinogenemia will also have a prolongation of the thrombin time, which was done in this patient and was confirmed. Uh, so most of us are trained to think that when there is an umbilical cord bleeding, the first differential diagnosis that enters our minds is a factor 13 deficiency. But it's good to remember that some rare bleeding disorders like afibrinogenemia may also present with umbilical cord bleeding. The other causes for PT and APTT prolongation are vitamin K deficiency, liver disease, DIC, and uh, the common pathway factor deficiencies. So in this case, what I would like to highlight is that incomplete screening, that is the omission of a fibrinogen assay in, in, the, in the initial testing, delayed the diagnosis. And most labs uh, would just run a PT and APTT and may not uh, run the fibrinogen unless specifically asked for. So though this diagnosis is rare, it shouldn't be missed just because a fibrinogen assay has been uh, uh, omitted from the primary screen. And sometimes it may lead to unnecessary vitamin K therapy as it was in, uh, seen in this case. The next case is that of an 18-year-old female who had menorrhagia since puberty and she had history of post-traumatic ecchymosis, petechiae and bleeding from minor wounds. She gave history of jaundice uh, three months back and had slightly altered uh, uh, liver enzymes at uh, uh, the time of testing. 
A recent ultrasound had revealed hepatomegaly and uh, a thickened endometrium. She had mild anemia and the platelet count was normal. So uh, when we did her coagulation screen, we saw that the PT was mildly prolonged and uh, a mixing study on the PT now showed that on addition of normal pool plasma, this corrected to the reference range. So uh, and uh, since an isolated PT uh, prolongation is associated with a factor 7 deficiency, we attempted a correction with 1 is to 1 mix of factor 7 deficient plasma, which showed no correction. So uh, this was suggestive of a factor 7 deficiency because she had bleeding, a PT prolongation and a failure to correct with factor 7 a deficient plasma. Uh, we wanted to confirm this with a factor 7 assay, but we did not have enough sample to do that at this sitting, so we asked her to come back for a repeat sample. She reported nearly four weeks later, and before running the sample for a factor 7 assay, the uh, alert resident over there repeated the coagulation screen. And at this time, we saw that the PT, which was initially prolonged, had now become normal. The APTT and fibrinogen continued to remain normal. So now we were looking at a patient who had a bleeding disorder with normal PT, APTT, and fibrinogen. In this setting, we usually like to exclude von Willebrand disease, uh, factor 13 deficiency, and a platelet function defect. So a factor 13 deficiency uh, was screened with the urea clot solubility test, which was negative in this patient. Uh, so this was not likely to be a factor 7 deficiency or a factor 13 deficiency. We did not have the von Willebrand factor antigen testing uh, kits at uh, uh, when this patient had arrived. So the only thing available to us at that time to do was the uh, aggregation studies. So we uh, undertook light transmission aggregometry in this patient. So unlike testing for uh, PT and APTT, for this test, we need platelet-rich plasma. And to that, we add agonists like ADP, arachidonic acid, collagen, and epinephrine. And uh, the sample is incubated. Uh, the transmission of light through this platelet-rich plasma is measured. As platelets begin to aggregate in the presence of these agonists, the transmission of light through the sample increases, and this is seen as a curve on the uh, recording system. So in a normal individual, on addition of these agonists, we get these curves. And they usually uh, have a good uh, height above the baseline, and uh, uh, well above 60%, as you can see here. But in this patient, when we did this test, we found that there was very poor or absent aggregation with epinephrine, collagen, ADP, and arachidonic acid. The uh, sample is also subjected to ristocytin-induced uh, aggregation. And we usually use two concentrations for that, a low dose at 0.5 milligrams per milliliter of ristocytin and a high dose of 1.25 milligrams. In a normal individual, there should be no response at the low dose and a very good robust response at the high dose ristocytin. But in this patient, we could see no response to either low dose or high dose ristocytin. So she had absent aggregation with all the agonists that we had tested. At this post time, if we look at this aggregation study, the two likely possibilities are a fibrinogenemia or Glanzmann's thrombosthemia because there seems to be no interaction between the fibrinogen and the platelets in the platelet-rich plasma. Glanzmann's thrombosthemia is a result of a defect in the receptor 2B3A, which is uh, required for binding to fibrinogen and cross-linking the platelets to form a good platelet plug. So this can be confirmed by uh, uh, a fibrinogenemia was excluded in our patient because we had already tested the fibrinogen levels and they were normal. So the likely possibility was now a Glanzmann's thrombosthemia for which we ran a platelet flow cytometry. The platelets are gated uh, using uh, CD42B, which uh, uh, separates them from red blood cells. And after that, we look for the CD41, which is the marker for glycoprotein 2B, and CD61, which is the marker for glycoprotein 3A. Uh, after gating the platelets on a forward side scatter log uh, plot, we can see that in a normal individual, there is a good button with 41 and 61 positivity. Whereas in this child, these dated platelets were, uh, showed no labeling with CD41, and they were deficient in CD61. So this patient, who had come initially with a prolonged PT, and whom we thought had a factor 7 deficiency, actually had a Glanzmann's thrombosthemia. So this has uh, diagnosis as treatment implications because the platelet disorder usually merits 
uh, a platelet transfusion to control the bleeding, whereas a coagulation factor defect like factor 7 deficiency would have been managed with plasma. So this case actually uh, uh, signifies that presence of a comorbidity, in her case a recent hepatitis, uh, may have impaired the liver function leading to a transient loss of factor 7 and which masked her uh, Klansman's thrombosis. So the next patient was a 28-year-old male who came with history of muscle hematomas which had been noticed since he was two years of age. He had visited many doctors and had, they all felt that he had a bleeding disorder but the nature of the bleeding disorder could not be confirmed. Prior to coming to our center, he had a large muscle hematoma and he had received a plasma transfusion four weeks back. The screening tests revealed a normal PT, APTT and fibrinogen. And in this situation now, as you recall, we would like to test for a von Willebrand disease, a, a factor 13 deficiency and a platelet function disorder. So in the uh, urea clot solubility test, we try to see if there is a severe deficiency of factor 13. And the uh, uh, platelet poor plasma is clotted with thrombin or calcium. Uh, once, if there is enough factor 13 in the sample, this clot which is formed is uh, gets cross-linked and uh, remains intact even when we add a denaturing agent like 5 molar urea. But in a patient who is deficient in factor 13, because the uh, clot cannot uh, uh, be cross-linked, the fibrin cannot be cross-linked, the clot dissolves within an hour. And so if we look at the sample after, at the end of 24 hours incubation, if we see a good clot, that, that means the factor 13 levels are not deficient, whereas if the, there is no clot, then that suggests a severe factor 13 deficiency. In this patient, we could see the clot at the top, so he did not have a, a severe factor 13 deficiency. So uh, the next thing was to exclude a von Willebrand disease, which was done, uh, and we saw normal levels of the antigen and activity. We then carried out a light transmission agrogometry for platelet function testing, which also yielded normal results. So what did this patient have? We uh, were really not sure. And we had stored one sample of this patient for a newly acquired factor 13 antigen assay kit. When uh, we tested his sample uh, along with the others that we had collected uh, in this kit, we found that his factor 13 levels were actually low and the uh, were just 6.6 percent. So uh, what we could see is that uh, uh, when these factor, the patient may have breathing because of a low factor 13 antigen level, but this can get missed by a urea clot solubility test because it is insensitive to levels of factor 13 below 5%. Whenever uh, that is uh, occurring, there is need to confirm a factor 13 deficiency by an alternative method. And in fact, the, most of the scientific uh, societies now advise that it is better to go for a quantitative assay straight off rather than using the urea clot uh, solubility test to screen for factor 13 deficiency. The other thing that this case highlights is <coughs> that in most patients who have uh, a bleeding disorder and we are looking for abnormalities, we uh, ask them to wait for 10 days after a, a recent transfusion or a, a replacement therapy so that we may get the baseline levels of the common bleeding defects like factor 8 or 9 deficiency and get their baseline values. But with factor 13, it has a very long half-life and so it tends, transfused factor 13 would pr uh, persist in the circulation for a long time. And in this individual who actually had very low levels of factor 13, this was the transfused factor 13, the 6.6 percent that we saw, which was uh, continuing to remain in circulation. So had we not done an antigenic assay in this patient, we would have missed this factor 13 deficiency. Uh, the next child was a five-year-old girl who came with history of echinosis off and on for uh, two years. There was no history of transfusions uh, or a family history of bleeding. However, the mother had been found to have low platelet counts and had been labeled as a case of ITP. So she was referred by our pediatricians for uh, investigation of bleeding because they felt that this uh, bleeding could not be explained since she had her platelet count was not that low and uh, was close to 70,000. So the clinical possibilities here were, were a, either a von Willebrand disease or a platelet function defect. On screening, we saw that her APTT was prolonged and the uh, mixing study showed a factor deficiency. Uh, the factor deficiency was confirmed to be that of factor 8, which was 
uh, the platelet count was indeed low and she had some large platelets in the circulation. So we now have a child who's bleeding with a prolonged APTT and low factor VIII levels. So this looked very much like a von Willebrand disease. So the next thing to do would be to screen for von Willebrand disease, which revealed low levels of both the antigen and the von Willebrand factor activity. So the VWF GP1BR is an automated latex immunoassay, uh, which can be done on a coagulation analyzer. Uh, this looks at the ability of von Willebrand factor to bind to platelets. So both were reduced in this case. So this confirmed a diagnosis of von Willebrand disease. Now, after making the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease, we know that it has to be subclassified into the type 1, the type 2, or the type 3. Uh, type 1 and type 3 are quant uh, quantitative defects of von Willebrand uh, factor. In type 1, there is a mild or a partial deficiency, whereas in type 3, there is a very severe deficiency of von Willebrand factor and it is hardly measurable. This was out in this patient because we had some amount of factor 7, uh, factor uh, von Willebrand factor uh, antigen and activity. So now we need to, to distinguish between type 1 and type 2. Type 2 von Willebrand uh, disease is are the qualitative von Willebrand factor defects. Uh, these are related to a defective function of one or more parts of the von Willebrand factor molecule. So if the von Willebrand factor binding to factor 8 is deficient, then that type of von Willebrand disease is called type 2N. And this can be diagnosed by running a specific von Willebrand factor, uh, factor 8 binding assay usually done by ELISA method. If positive, then this is called a type 2N kind of a von Willebrand disease. In type 2A, type 2B, and type 2N von Willebrand disease, there is defective platelet binding of the von Willebrand factor. In type 2B, uh, there is a, a gain of function mutation on the von Willebrand factor molecule in its binding site for the platelet glycoprotein 1P. So instead of weak binding, there is an exaggerated binding and there is hyper aggregation uh, uh, for these, uh, 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 with this von Willebrand factor molecule for its platelet receptor. Whereas in type 2A and type 2M, there is defective platelet binding, it is diminished, but uh, von in von Willebrand factor type 2A, there is a loss of the high molecular weight multimers, whereas in type 2M, the multimers are present, but they are uh, defective. So uh, how do we go to the uh, to differentiate in this patient between a type 1 and a type 2 von Willebrand disease? So for that, we take the help of the activities to antigen ratios of von Willebrand. Uh, and so if we there is a concomitant decrease in the von Willebrand factor activity and the antigen, then the ratio of these two usually comes to uh, more than 0.7. This kind of uh, ratio is called a concordant ratio, and this is usually seen in type 1, von Willebrand disease. If the activity is decreased much more than the antigen, as occurs in the qualitative defects, then we get a ratio less than 0.7, and this type of uh, uh, ratio suggests a type 2, von Willebrand disease. So coming to our patient, her antigen levels were 27 and her activity level was 30. So the activity is to antigen ratio in this patient was uh, less than 0.7. So at this stage, what we can say is that this patient has a type 2 von Willebrand disease. Now we could not exclude type 2 N von Willebrand disease in our patient because this needs a uh, von Willebrand uh, factor 8 collagen, uh, von Willebrand factor 8 binding assay. So how do we differentiate between type 2A, 2B, and 2M? So this is usually a uh, resort of, to get this answer, we need to run a multimer al uh, assay. Uh, what is done is that the von Willebrand factor protein is run on an electrophoretic gel, and the multimers separate on the basis of different sizes uh, on the gel. One needs to look at the pattern of the loss of multimers, and if there's uh, internal structure, uh, which is in the form of triplets is preserved or is changed to decide what kind of uh, multimers have been lost. Uh, this is a very technically challenging test and takes nearly seven days to complete if uh, uh, done in the standard way. Uh, 
so, uh, thankfully it is not required for the diagnosis of type 1 or for type 3 von Willebrand disease. In type 3, there is a near absence of the uh, protein, so there are hardly any multiples to be seen. But in type 2 von Willebrand disease, in the type 2A type, there may be a loss of the high molecular weight uh, multimers as can be seen in lane 4 and 5 in this sample. In type 2M, the multimers may be present, but there may be an altered ratio. Uh, to pick up type 2B kind of von Willebrand disease, we need to, to run the ristocytin induced platelet aggregation assay. This assay checks the sensitivity of the patient's plasma to agglutinate platelets at varying doses of ristocytin ranging from 0.5 to 1.5 milligrams per ml using the technique of platelet aggregometry, which I've uh, just described a little time before. So here we use increasing concentrations of ristocytin going up from 0.5 to 1.5 and we look at the aggreg aggregation curves of the patient's plasma using normal platelets. At very low dose ristocytin, as we already know, there should be no aggregation in a normal individual and aggregation would usually appear between at around 1 to 1.5 uh, milligrams per ml. So in individuals where we get aggregation at low dose, these are suggestive of a type 2B von Willebrand disease. In small children where we have to test for these disorders, it's very difficult to get adequate platelet-rich plasma to carry out all these multiple concentrations of the REPA. So we and many other labs use the abbreviated REPA. We use only two concentrations. The low dose seen as this blue line, which is at 0.5 milligrams per ml of ristocytin and the high dose, which is 2.5 milligrams per ml of ristocytin. In a normal individual, we do not expect any uh, aggregation with the low dose, but we expect a good uh, response with the high dose ristocytin. So when we perform this test in this child, what we see is that instead of getting a flat line at low dose, we are getting uh, an, a very good aggregation with 0.5 milligrams per ml of ristocytin. So this is the hyper aggregation occurring at low dose ristocytin and the likely uh, differential diagnosis here is now either a uh, type 2b kind of a von Willebrand disease where if you recall the uh, von Willebrand factor molecule has an increased affinity for its uh, uh, platelet receptor or the same clinical and laboratory phenotype can be reproduced by a gain of function mutation on the platelet receptor for a normal von Willebrand factor molecule. So either the platelet or the von Willebrand factor molecule is defective, but they would produce the same results. So to differentiate this, one can perform a mixing study on the wash platelets and uh, using uh, normal platelets, normal plasma, patient platelets and patient plasma to see which one is defective. So we did the mixing study with low dose ristocytin in this patient. When we used a mixture of uh, the normal platelets with patient plasma at 0.5 milligram per ml, we saw that the curve returned to the way it was expected to be in a normal individual. So what this shows us is that the patient's plasma is normal. And when we repeated the test with the patient's platelets on 0.5 milligrams per ml of ristocytin, we see that we got the abnormal aggregation again. So this indicates that the patient's platelets are abnormal. So at this stage, we see a pattern which is suggestive of the platelet type von Willebrand disease. Now this needs to be confirmed on molecular analysis uh, for the gain of function mutation on the GP1D receptor on the platelets. At that time, the lab did not have this facility and we just stored the uh, uh, DNA sample of this patient to be run at a later stage. In the meanwhile, if we come back to the von Willebrand factor uh, uh, gene, and uh, molecule, we can see that this is a huge gene which is located on the short arm of chromosome 12. It has nearly 52 exons and spans nearly 178 kilobase pairs. This codes for a very long uh, protein and which has multiple domains which perform a variety of functions. The factor 8 binding, the glycoprotein 1B binding domain for platelets, collagen binding domain, the dimerization mm -hmm. of the von Willebrand factor mm. molecules and the multimerization. Uh, any defect in the gene anywhere can uh, result in defective function, but it has been found 
that most of the mutations associated with the type 2B phenotype are mapped onto the exon 28 of the von Willebrand factor G. So when we did get access to this, the primers for this, my colleagues in the uh, genetics lab, when they were in a position to do this testing, we uh, retrieved this patient's sample and uh, uh, submitted it for testing. She was asymptomatic in the meanwhile, needed no further transfusion and had already left. Uh, uh, she was uh, not reporting for any further therapy at that time. When we ran the sample on Sanger sequencing, it was noticed that at codon 3916, there was a mutation in exon 28 where site, uh, uh, the C was replaced by T, resulting in arginine being replaced by tryptophan. Now, this mutation has been previously described in uh, type 2B von Willebrand disease, and there are reports of it occurring in our country also. So, what we had labeled as a platelet type von Willebrand disease on the mixing study was actually a type 2B von Willebrand disease. The defect was not in the platelet GP1B receptor, but it was present on the von Willebrand factor molecule. So, the learning lesson in this case is that genetic testing is mandatory for differentiating between type 2B von Willebrand disease and the platelet type von Willebrand disease. And this we know has treatment uh, implications because uh, platelet type 1 Willebrand disease will not uh, respond to replacement of uh, factor concentrates. Uh, this has now, of course, been very well highlighted in the recent von Willebrand disease guidelines from the ISTH, where it says that if a patient is suspected to have type 2B von Willebrand disease, one should immediately reflex to genetic testing. And if it is positive for the type 2B von, uh, variant, uh, von Willebrand disease variants, then the diagnosis should be confirmed. If it is negative for the type 2B variants, then one should run a restocytin induced platelet aggregation. And if then, it is positive for uh, the REPA test, then we should evaluate uh, for a possible mutation on the GP1B receptor of the platelets. If it is negative, then a type 2A von Willebrand disease can be diagnosed. So if we need to make a diagnosis of von Willebrand disease uh, very accurately now, we need the help of a genetic lab. Uh, a three-year-old female child presented with epistic epistaxis of one month duration. She had gum bleeds and easy bruisability. She was the product of a non-consanguineous marriage and had anemia. And her investigations had revealed a beta thalassemia trait. So the clinician suspected a possibility of one Willebrand disease and referred her for testing. Uh, her APTT was prolonged. The mixing studies showed us a factor 8 deficiency pattern, which was confirmed by running a factor 8 assay. The von Willebrand factor antigen and activity levels were both low. So in this uh, young girl with bleeding and a factor 8 deficiency along with a von Willebrand factor deficiency, we labeled her as a severe von Willebrand disease because she had very low levels of von Willebrand factor. In such situations, we like to screen the parents. So both the mother and father were normal and this severe von Willebrand disease is usually inherited as an autosomal uh, recessive uh, disorder. Now the teaching in von Willebrand disease is that whenever you make a diagnosis, always confirm it on a repeat sample since there are many environmental factors which can affect the results of von Willebrand factor testing. So we asked the mother to bring the child again for a repeat test at a, after a couple of months because we had limited the uh, kits of the antigen and activity assay at that time. But the mother was very concerned and she brought the patient within a month itself. So we were una unable to do the antigen and activity testing, but we repeated a factor 8 assay, which was low. And instead of the, the uh, antigen and activity assay, we now did a light transmission aggregometry, which was available at that time, which showed almost absent aggregation with restocytin high dose. So this looked like a severe von Willebrand disease. And in these cases, if we add a normal amount of uh, 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 normal pool, uh, if we add one part of normal pool plasma, we can see that the, there is a correction. So this is also a feature of severe von Willebrand disease. Uh, when she came again after uh, another month, we could do the antigen assay and this was found to be normal. And finally, when we had both kids available nearly about nine months later, we repeated her tests and the child showed both low factor, uh, one Willebrand factor antigen and activity levels. So her overall profile was fitting with a severe von Willebrand disease. The pediatricians counseled the mother because she was keen for uh, another pregnancy. 
and was advised to undergo mutation testing prior to conceiving. The uh, child herself was uh, asymptomatic and was doing well. So the mother took a private consultation at another center and where the, all the tests were rerun. And at that, test, uh, at that center, nearly two years later, it was found that her factor VIII assay levels were now normal. And the von Willebrand factor antigen levels, which we had found were less than 1%, were reported to be normal. This center did not have the antigen and activity yet, so they did a light transmission agrometry, which showed uh, that the uh, functional activity of platelet binding of the von Willebrand factor was impaired. So with normal antigen and impaired activity, they labeled this as a case of type 2 von Willebrand disease. This was really worrying now because the diagnosis seemed to have changed. So we convinced the mother to send the sample of the index case for mutation testing. But to our surprise, when we got the results, no mutation was found in the uh, von Willebrand factor gene. The child herself remained well, and other than poor height and weight gain, she was doing well. And the mother had was taking some homeopathic treatment for her, this, uh, uh, for uh, on the advice of uh, her uh, peers for the bleeding disorder. Uh, since there was no mutation detecting uh, detected. The mother opted for a pregnancy and the nipple testing, of course, was not done. She delivered a healthy male child and she came back with a request for recheck of the index case after a couple of years saying that she now felt that the child had completely been cured with homeopathic medicines. This looked a little, uh, you know, uh, difficult to swallow. So we repeated the test and now at our center, we noticed that her antigen activity and factor rate levels were all normal, which was again repeated the next year. So a child whom we had labeled as severe von Willebrand disease was found to have a type 2 kind of uh, phenotype at another center. And after nearly a long period of five to six years, we saw that her uh, uh, von Willebrand factor uh, activity and antigen levels were completely normal. So this kind of uh, the findings can only fit with an acquired von Willebrand syndrome, which is uh, characterized by a structural or functional qualitative defect of von Willebrand factor. Uh, it is associated with defects in the thyroid function or lymphoproliferative disorders and uh, myeloproliferative states. It usually presents late in life and there's a negative bleeding history, but the laboratory phenotype can look like type 1, type 2 or type 3 von Willebrand disease. In children, it's, it's exceedingly uh, rare and it's usually associated with congenital uh, heart defects where the uh, high molecular weight multimers of von Willebrand factor are destroyed or as a result of antibodies in SLD or maybe even drug related. The additional investigations with echocardiography, thyroid profile, platelet counts and uh, the, uh, autoimmune testing were normal. There was no history of a recent viral infection prior to initial testing. So the final diagnosis was labeled as an idiopathic acquired von Willebrand syndrome. This case emphasizes the importance of follow up, repeat testing and record keeping in order to uh, reach the correct diagnosis in some patients which may be difficult to make at the first go. So I would conclude by saying good history is indispensable for good results in coagulation testing. Piecemeal screening can delay diagnosis, as we saw in the case with afibrinogenemia. Confirmatory tests are mandatory for final characterization of bleeding defects and acquired coagulation uh, uh, coagulopathies arising out of liver disorders and DIC can confound or mask an underlying disorder. Retesting is required in such situations, and as of today, genetics will have an indispensable role in accurate diagnosis of some of our coagulopathies. Learning never ends in medicine, and that is true for the coagulation lab as well. I've had the good fortune of being taught by some uh, really good teachers, and I take this as an opportunity to thank some of them. Dr. Neelam Marwaha uh, for her wonderful Tuesday afternoon sessions on uh, case discussions in bleeding disorders, which were absolutely unmissable. Mr. A.P. Chauhan, Mr. Joseph Masi, and Mr. Sunil Kumar Bose, who actually carried the coagulation lab on their shoulders, uh, who with their passion and dedication for coagulation testing, ensured that we returned the best patient care results uh, possible at that time, and uh, their passion for teaching has uh, benefited the scores of students who pass through the portals of uh, pathology in PGI. And I would like to acknowledge the uh, help and support of my colleagues in the coagulation lab, Dr. Narendra Kumar, the uh, staff who has diligently worked up all these cases, clinical colleagues in pediatric hematology, oncology, and clinical hematology units, 
who have trusted us with their patient samples and helped us to learn along the way the dm residents of hematology pediatric hematology oncology and adult clinical hematology oncology unit who are actually the backbone uh, do the diligent uh, following up of cases take the case histories and ask us all those difficult questions which help us to learn with that i end my presentation and i'd be happy to take any questions thank you thank you ma'am uh, for such an illustrative presentation i hope everyone have enjoyed uh, the seminar like me uh, most of the cases are quite interesting and uh, these will definitely help uh, uh, the young hematopathologist while dealing in routine basis uh, i am not able to see any comments or question uh, in the chat box so may i ask few questions if you allow please go ahead uh, narendra your questions are always welcome uh, so ma'am uh, in the second case uh, that was a newborn uh, that presented with multiple factor deficiency and later on we found that it was uh, the patient was having actually hemophilia yes uh, so uh, can you uh, tell all of us that uh, whether uh, we need to perform factor 8 assess straight away in all cases with multiple factor deficiency or we have to wait and see whether this patient is responding to uh, uh, this vitamin k supplements or this and then we should do factor 8 assess uh narendra this is a really difficult question you have asked and uh, uh, i i don't think i have a very good answer to that it would be very uh, you know non scientific to say that test every patient who comes with an intracranial hemorrhage uh, in uh, the neonatal period for factor 8 deficiency in this case i think there was a little clue that the uh, aptt was very very prolonged as compared to the pt which should have alerted us but somehow you know at that time when you see multiple uh, factor deficiencies and you see a prolonged pt you get uh, convinced that this may not be an uh, there may not be an underlying factor 8 deficiency here uh, this was just because we asked for a repeat sample and uh, which we should do in all testing that we have carried out at uh, in children less than 6 years of age a uh, 6 months of age where we think there is uh, multiple coagulation factor deficiencies we should do that but even there even doing that it was only the prolonged aptt on the repeat test which provided the clue there was no way i think we could have thought initially that there is a factor 8 deficiency and i don't think i would say that we must exclude a factor 8 deficiency in every patient uh, every neonate who comes with an intracranial hemorrhage i don't know if i have answered that question to your satisfaction ah uh, yes ma'am uh, i completely agree with you that uh, i think we have to wait for multiple sampling i think we should see the response first and then we we'll go what is happening in the next hemograph uh, sorry coagulation sample then we can do apt value then we can decide whether we have to repeat or not uh, there was one case ma'am uh, of uh, factor 13 deficiency in that we have done factor 13 a antigen uh, yes. SD, yes yes so uh, many colleagues even ask us that uh, why you have people are not performing uh, factor 13 b unit so does it really necessary uh so uh, thankfully the 13 uh, for factor 13 uh, we have the 13a subunit which is catalytic and the 13b unit subunit which is the carrier unit uh thankfully in factor 13 deficiency most of the deficiencies are associated with the uh, problems in the catalytic unit so if there is really a severe kind of factor 13 deficiency we should be able to pick it up with just a factor 13a uh, screening but if you are really working in a reference lab and you need to pinpoint what kind of a deficiency it is whether it is related to factor 13b or to 13a then of course we would need to run an elisa of factor 13b and also possibly for the 13a and b combined uh, antigens also the most important thing which we must remember from that case is that many uh, the scientific body say that we should not uh, do you know the urea clot solubility test at all and we must do a functional assay uh, up front this is very easily said because uh, but difficult to do because most of the coagulation analyzers do not offer a functional assay for factor 30 so we need to you know uh, rely on biochemical procedures to reach a factor 13 deficiency if we want to uh pinpoint it initially but i think in the practical sense if we have a very low antigenic factor 13 uh, there's no reason to think that there wouldn't be a factor 13 deficiency in the sample 
thank you ma'am uh, yes ask yes, a question yes yeah, thank you dr jasmina for a wonderful set of cases uh, which kept a person like me also listening to you till the very end uh, well i really had a very basic doubt uh, uh, and that was when you do these mixing tests you know and something is prolonged the next step you do is you showed us what you do is a mixing test uh so how do you go about it you like you have several kind of deficient plasmas of course one is you add plasma to the the test plasma and the normal plasma in a certain ratio and then how do you go about choosing which of the factor deficient plasmas you put or whatever you're going to add is there some sort of an algorithm or uh, how do you do it i mean that was my question to you that's such a good question ma'am thank you for bringing this up so uh, the most important thing that we need to do is to establish whether there is a whether there is a factor deficiency or an inhibitor and that simple question can be answered by just adding normal pool plasma after that some centers straight away go to uh, do a factor assay you know of multiple factors depending on which test was prolonged so if you have an isolated aptt one would uh, some centers would like to straight away go off for a factor 8 9 11 assay and the first assay to be done would be of course the most common deficiency would put, which would be factor 8 if you don't get that then go to factor 9 then to factor 11 and so on if you have an isolated pt prolongation which shows correction on mixing then you do a factor 7 assay if you have both prolonged then uh, you can do a factor 2 5 and 10 assay but what uh, 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 this turns out to be a very expensive exercise for most labs because factor assays are very expensive so what we do is we store an aliquot of factor deficient plasma and when uh, we see an aptt prolongation we try and do a mixing study with those factors which are affected in the uh, the intrinsic pathway whereas if the, there is an isolated pt prolongation then we do a mixing with those factors which are likely to affect the extrinsic pathway for instance factor 7 and we go by the most common first and then the less common uh, factor uh, deficiencies that are to be expected i hope that answers your question ma'am yeah thank you so much yeah so ma'am there are few comments uh, professor uh, shiv bushmat have mentioned that the clinician tend to uh, take up team um team the test for correlation on the computer and often don't know what to do with the results they call up you to ask whether heparin should be increased or decreased or whether they should change the drug for anticoagulation we need to charge them for consultation uh, thank you for that comment sir uh, yeah jasmina yes, i never heard you before very very impressed and uh, i think you have hit the nail right on the head on where we wanted these lectures to target I uh, enjoyed speaking to you. I was just, you know, uh, I'm not a hematologist or a coagulation expert, but that general tendency is there for clinicians because now there are 30, 40 tests available. They keep ticking. They don't know why they are ticking. They spit out a whole lot of results, and they don't know how to interpret them. I heard a very interesting talk by Michael Lapasota. I don't know if you have heard of him. He's from Texas. and he said we should be charging for all these curbside cons- consultations because all they are interested in is increase the heparin or decrease the heparin or do some other <laughs> drugs so i think your case has brought home a very nice lucid analysis on how to problem solve in a given situation very grateful keep it up thank you Rina Das Ma'am has mentioned that excellent cases with wonderful presentation. Uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar has written that very informative presentation, truly a problem solving in difficult situation. Dr. Sri Devi Sitaram uh, has mentioned lucid analysis of a complex topic. I'm very grateful for the encouraging comment. Thank you. So I think there But is. Can, a, I, can uh, I make a comment? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, this is this is Nadim. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Mila, I just wanted to ask you one small little question. This is just trying to make it a bit lighter. Inherited, acquired, one will have been treated with homeopathy. Why don't you give them some credit? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, uh, Nadeem, uh, I presented this case in a very calm fashion, but I tell you, I shivered each time when the patient's mother came to me for repeat testing because her test seemed to be changing from what we had initially diagnosed and she was pretty conf convinced that that was all thanks to the homeopathic medicine that she had been taking. It took us nearly five years to reach the final answer in this patient and I'm so uh, grateful to that mother because she didn't you know, lose her patience with us and carried on with all the tests that we did. You know as well as me that uh, how we treat uh, inherited bleeding disorders but uh, it's sometimes you know uh, the other important lesson which I meant, learned from this case was we tend to distrust our colleagues in other labs. In uh, most centers, we would like to repeat all the tests ourselves to be sure that whatever res results we've got are reliable and correct. But in this case, I'm sure I would have not even thought of an alternative diagnosis had the second lab not pointed out that the antigen levels had become normal and the activity levels were still low. So repeat testing sometimes is required, and especially in von Willebrand disease, to re reach the correct diagnosis. Thank yeah, you. Would be would be would be you know interested to know what was the second lab comment on PGI's you know opinion. Uh, the second uh, she. <laughs> I wouldn't like to say that because I don't have uh, direct information of what they felt about us. But I, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, because uh, if they felt that uh, there was some error in our testing, because a child had become asymptomatic. Actually, that should have also been a red flag to all of us in the lab that she doesn't uh, seem to have any more bleeding symptoms over so many years. But her tests were so abnormal when we had done them. Yeah, I have another question to you, uh, Jasmina. You did mention that uh, we need to be very careful when we interpret pediatric uh, tests and we need to have references. So uh, we also have regional ethnic variation, for example. And uh, my question to you is, has your lab built up uh, references for the Indian adult and the Indian pediatric population? Ma'am, that's a very uh, pertinent uh, comment that you have made, but it's a very, very difficult exercise and very well recognized the world over that setting up a reference range for children is almost next to impossible because it's very difficult to get consent to bleed well children. And uh, most of the reference ranges that we uh, people working in labs use are those provided by companies on some studies carried out in different parts of the world. So we really do not have uh, evidence to say that, yes, we did test out a normal uh, reference population in our children and found that their uh, antigen levels are different. But you know what you have raised is so very important because we know for sure in adults that factor eight levels and von Willebrand factor antigen levels are higher in the Indian population as compared to the rest of the world. So who knows what the picture is in uh, little children. But uh, it is a very difficult exercise, and I have to admit that we haven't done that for our lab. Uh, it has a lot of ethical uh, connotations to getting those kind of samples, but it's definitely worth uh, you know, taking up if we get cooperation from uh, multiple centers to set up a sort of a national uh, reference uh, range for children. I'm sure it will Thank benefit you. many people. Thanks a lot. Uh, Jasmine, I had a question. Uh, yes. Yeah, this um, we find this uh, subdural hematomas, or uh, you know, like in units in quite a few uh, babies. And you said that not all of them need to be investigated. Now, uh, when we have such uh, cases in the periphery, it's not easy to send them to a referral center for uh, further investigation. Is it possible to transport samples? And uh, how much uh, samples do you ask for? How do you transport them? Uh, are there any tips for the people at the periphery? Uh, so uh, uh, thank you for that question, Sri Devi. Uh, samples can be transported. And uh, what if we are planning to transport samples, then uh, they have to be, uh, the plasma has to be, the sample has to be centrifuge. The plasma has to be separated and sent uh, uh, in dry ice. But the problem is 
that in our country transport is often you know of the sample it's very difficult to monitor it all along the way that the uh, transport conditions have been managed and i am uh, i have umpteen instances of uh, getting referrals into our lab for a factor 8 deficiency or a 8 and 9 combined deficiency in patients who have uh, you know samples sent from remote areas to a referral lab in a big city uh, and when we test them out we find that they are normal uh, it's important to remember that if we want to undertake this exercise then the best thing would be to send a normal sample along with the patient sample so that we can test out both and only if the normal sample we returns normal results should we take the patient sample uh, results as proper for reporting that's often very difficult to do because again you would have to bleed a normal child and give us a normal sample you know so that we are sure that uh, uh, what has happened to the sample is not a deterioration in transport i, I think uh, i may have not conveyed myself well these patients need to be investigated definitely but they may not have all of them may not have factor 8 deficiency that's uh, I, i probably right. didn't make that very clear no no that was clear yes very much thank you <laughs> thank you So, Mr. Bose has mentioned man, that my soul is uh, still in the cognition lab. Your lecture is very refreshing to all of us. Thank you for those very kind words, Mr. Bose. We are grateful to you and uh, so many people who have taught us all along these years. Thank you, ma'am. Well, one thing, <coughs> see, one thing which we practice, you know, in. in the private sector is because we are also transporting samples to long distances is we don't uh, we don't uh, ask for a normal sample to be transported alongside but what we do is we transport a qt sample uh, i didn't get that nadi can you repeat uh, we transport, we transport a, a qc sample a quality control okay. sample along okay 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 the value okay. of which has already been determined okay so and and we try to assess the qc sample before running the transported sample that's absolutely fine so you run a very good lab i can say that but i am not sure whether that practice is uniform across the country no it is not because uh, most of the people don't do but we advocate people who are who are receiving samples from this different places rather than, and because it's very difficult to monitor uh, you know have a delta check monitoring of temperature all across right and as you rightly said the, even the best of uh, the dry eyes will not stand the temperature variation which we have in our country so what we do is we we try to monitor the qc sample alongside and see the we you know the qc cv and we try to check the qc how it is functioning and then we run the mail sample thank you for that i uh, we have no experience of private lab so this is a very valid valuable uh, contribution sir um, uh, nadi thanks a lot it was a wonderful lecture ma'am vijay this side really we enjoyed it thoroughly thank you vijay so i think there is uh, no more questions or comments uh, this will bring the end of uh, this session and i'm sure everyone has enjoyed uh, the seminar and uh, we are really grateful to you ma'am for giving your precious time and from the whole uh, i would like to thank that uh, the whole working committee of uh, this space group uh, along with uh, the dr nadeem who has facilitated everything uh, we would like also like to thank the all that and is Uh, who, who have given uh, the time and uh, uh, are their presence that they are present so, so late so uh, thank you so much everyone so with this i think we would we'll end the session thank you thank you thank you ma'am thank you dr nandan yeah. thank you